Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. My guest today is Dr. Matt Willicky. He's a PhD graduate from UCLA. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Mike, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm really excited to uh, chat with you today. But before we get into it, Matt, can you just maybe give the audience a little bit of a brief background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, by training, I'm an isotope geochemist. Um, so that's essentially a geologist, but I really look at the chemistry of rocks. And like you said, I did my PhD at UCLA. Um, I've been a faculty member at the University of Alabama for uh, about seven years now, since 2016. And my research is on things like early earth and the origin of life. But because my expertise in isotope geochemistry is very similar to what is used in the field of climate science, I muse a lot about climate science on social media. And so that's probably what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I just, I, I feel that because I don't have any skin in the game, I'm not, a, a, I'm not working with fossil fuel industry folks. I don't work in climate science per se. I can take an objective look. And so I, 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 I like to discuss things a little bit outside my research, um, you know, in the public sphere. Okay, excellent. Well, I think a lot of people, you know, uh, definitely appreciate that because, you know, obviously, uh, throughout COVID, there's been a lot of, you know, misinformation that's that's gone on. Um, you know, there's numerous things that I can list off, but just for instance, you know, the new bivalent uh, booster that's been uh, released, you know, pretty recently a lot over the last few months, just came out a couple new studies show that that actually has no extra uh, protection over uh, the uh, previous standard mRNA vaccines. And, you know, we know lockdowns, there's, been, there's a million things that have happened, you know, and that have been said publicly that came out to not be true or to be completely false and sometimes even the opposite and, and certainly uh, harmful in a lot of ways as well. Um, you know, when it comes to climate change, you know, I think that people want to avoid those, you know, same mistakes. We don't want to be doing things that we don't have to do if the science isn't there. And so I think that a lot of people now, you know, they fear that, you know, the way that the government and certain organizations use COVID as kind of a weapon to, um, you know, instill fear in people and to create these lockdowns and, and just to, you know, create a lot of havoc over a lot of people's lives. You know, people are, you know, skeptical now of, of, uh, of, of climate and, you know, what that is actually going to do. And if the government is then going to kind of use climate to impose new rules, new mandates, and these kind of things. And so is that, Matt, kind of the reason why you focus or, or are looking at climate change now or interested in climate change? Or what was your, what, what, why did you get into it in the first place? Yeah, so I pretty much entered into this argument from speaking to my students. And I, as you said, I see a lot of overlaps with COVID and the climate debate as it's, as it's portrayed you know, online and things like that. But I really started to get attracted to this by speaking to students. And I, I think during COVID, the, the virtual learning was a disaster. But one thing that it helped was it kind of opened up students to discuss more things with faculty. I think they felt maybe a little more comfortable. They're in their pajamas. They're in their dorm room. Everybody's left the Zoom. The lecture's over. But I'm, I hang around and answer some questions. And so we would start discussing things that kind of went off topic from science. And I have you know, two young children, I have a five and seven year old. And so I commonly would ask folks, you know, are you planning on having children? Like, what's your future? What do you plan on doing with your career? And, you know, just kind of questions that maybe I didn't really ask before when I was just, uh, when I wasn't a father, I didn't really think about that. We just focused on the science, but kind of, you know, becoming a father kind of opened my eyes to thinking about, well, what do these kids plan on doing in their lives and in the future? And it, it, I started thinking about that more. And what I noticed was that these children were, were, I mean, these aren't kids, these are young adults. These young adults are essentially being stripped of hope. They were so demoralized. They, I mean, multiple students told me that although they felt like they were gonna have children their whole life, they don't see that happening in their future anymore. They think that they, they would feel guilty if they brought a child into this world because the world isn't gonna be around for many more years and there's gonna be this collapse. And I just saw the mental, toll that it was taking. Now, obviously, COVID was adding to that. But I started to really kind of think about this, like, what is the benefit of telling people there is a crisis and an emergency? And what are the drawbacks? 
And I was clearly seeing what the drawbacks were on terms of the mental health. And so I wanted to kind of investigate it and start to look for myself. And as I started to, to kind of wade into this field, it's very murky, it's very, you know, I mean, people are very passionate about this. So the minute you say something or start asking questions, you become a heretic essentially. But as I started to explore uh, the, the, the most up-to-date science in, in, the, in, the, in climate science, what I noticed was that by my metrics or by any metrics, I'm an analytical chemist, so I needed to kind of assign a metric to it. And by any metric that I was assigning, I couldn't find compelling evidence that we were in a climate emergency or a climate crisis, even though we were shoving this stuff down these young people's throats and it was clearly having an effect on them. And so I, I just started to discuss it a little bit online. Um, I asked them right away what their favorite social media was and they said TikTok. So I started a TikTok um, a year ago and it very quickly got to about 30,000 followers. But then I got on in August of this year, I was banned. I was shadow banned on TikTok. So I saw a 90% decre decrease in the views. And then I started to get a little bit more active on Twitter. Um, but I just wanted to reach young people and show them, look, the data that's out there, at least in my mind, is not compelling evidence that we are in a crisis or emergency. There are problems we have to fix things. There's definitely going to be challenges in the future. By no means should we just be, you know, taking our planet for granted. But at the same time, we shouldn't be claiming that the planet is going to end in eight or 12 years. I mean, there's literally a clock somewhere on the side of a building that's ticking down numbers from like eight years to, from now where the planet's supposed to end. And these young people see this, they don't, they don't go and dig into the science. They see these headlines and how the media, you know, portrays this and, and basically catastrophizes this and manipulates the data. And it's just taking a huge toll on them. And so I really started to speak out. And before I knew it, you know, folks like Jordan Peterson had had retweeted things. And so it got a little bigger than I ever kind of expected. But, you know, if I could just ease some of these young folks' minds, I think it's worth it, even though you know, we can talk about what possible career implications speaking out against something like this has. But that's kind of what got me into it. I just really saw the mental toll on my students. And then, and I just don't think the data supports the, the anguish we're putting them through. So I, you know, firstly, I really applaud all of your effort and your courage in, in bringing this to light, because uh, I do think it's extremely important. And you know, obviously, when you do that, you're always kind of you know, putting yourself out there and even putting yourself up for, for, for criticism. So, and especially by, you know, probably your academic colleagues, which tend to be the worst when you say anything against the mainstream narrative, that's, that tends to be, uh, you know, my experience anyway. Um, but, you know, why is it now like in 2010, in 2022 and 2023 that, you know, climate is such a hot topic? You know, I, I mean, I was born in the eighties, I'm, I'm 84 birthday, but like, and there's been some talk, you know, you know, about the environment, we've always had to learn about the environment and, you know, treat the environment right and, and that kind of thing. But it's not like it is, it's not like, a, you know, it has been over the last, you know, year or two, it just seems like climate change has become this major, major topic now over the last year or two. So why did it suddenly become a major topic? you know, in maybe 2021, 2022, now 2023, like, why is it a big topic now? And why wasn't it a big topic, say, you know, in the early 2000s or in the 90s? And like, what has changed? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I mean, I, I, I could speculate that I would say that the, the thing that I noticed mm -hmm. is that the, the way that the message is being portrayed by particularly things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the verbiage that they're using has changed pretty dramatically. And, you know, I, I think it's on purpose. It used to be that the claims were, you know, the future can be troublesome. We have to be careful. We're predicting that we may have these things occurring in the near future. So we should start adjusting our policies now. And if you read the IPCC fifth and sixth reports, particularly the sixth report, the, the way that they speak about the, the climate system changes pretty dramatically from, we predict future issues coming up and we should be adjusting our policies to mitigate those future issues to, we are in a crisis and an emergency right now. 
And it's no longer that these things are going to be occurring in the future and we should be adjusting our policies. It is, we are in the mode now, the planet is essentially on fire. And the media loves that, right? If it bleeds, it leads. So they take that verbiage and they even expand it even more. And so that stuff gets a ton of clicks and it gets a ton of attention. And so I think you've just seen this exponential ramp up as the IPCC starts to change the way they discuss this stuff to the way the media is taking off with it. And it's just had this exponential growth and it's, and while it's being talked about more, it's being talked about more in more of a catastroph catastrophic way. It's not that more people are just talking about climate mm -hmm. and discussing it openly and, and thinking about things. It's this rhetoric of this, this, this is a catastrophe. This is a crisis. This is an emergency. And I just think that human beings, when we're in crisis or emergency mode, we don't make very good decisions. Agreed. It's not a good idea to be in fight or flight. That's why we try, to, we try to avoid that response. That's really kind of our, right, our kind of last resort. And so telling folks and putting these folks, these young people especially, in this mode of, well, I only have eight or 12 years to live, it just, I mean, it, it was remarkable what it was doing to their, to, their, uh, to their mental health. So I think I put a lot of blame on the IPCC, but honestly, it's, it's tough, you know, it's tough to pin this down. It's probably not monocausal like most things that's going to be complicated, but I definitely think that the, the, the way that the IPCC, which is not a science panel, this is a governmental Right, it's the intergovernmental panel. This is bureaucrats and, and policymakers. And, and IPCC, can can you just explain that acronym for the audience? After you sure, the that's the intergovernmental panel on climate change. DC, okay. so there's a hundred and something, fifty or something countries that come together and they put funds together, and they do use a ton of scientists and a ton of climate scientists provide data. And so, but ultimately the reports are written by these policymakers and these bureaucrats. And this is a, a, a panel that is trying to push policy. This okay, is so hang, hang on there j just for a sec. So you're saying that even though there's scientists on the panel, it's ge generally um, the legislation, the policies, those are written by bureaucrats, politicians, and not by scientists. Yeah, that's right. So the way that they do it is they have working groups and those working groups are the scientists and they write assessments that are part of the, from the working groups. And then the bureaucrats take these different working groups and these different assessments and they write a final report that they put out to decision makers and leaders and bureaucrats. That final report is written by policymakers. They are taking the scientific input from the scientists, but there's been multiple times that scientists have removed themselves from the final report because the data that was being presented in the final report was being manipulated in order to, or at least discussed in a manner that I don't think anybody's really fudging numbers, but you know, it's, you can do statistical tricks and you can play with figures. You can make things appear more catastrophic than they are. And so multiple yeah. times scientists have removed their names from the final report because they said the final report didn't actually follow the working assessment that was written directly by the scientists. And that happens in, in the pharmaceutical companies as well. So what happens there is that, uh, you know, a pharmaceutical company will do a study and then they will review the study internally. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly what they do to the data, but they certainly always want to make it more favorable to, to their outcome. And then they have scientists peer review it then, which means that those scientists are not necessarily peer reviewing the raw data. They're peer reviewing the data that was given to them from the pharmaceutical company that has likely been altered by the time that it gets there. So I kind of see a little bit of a parallel between the pharmaceutical companies and you know climate and what's going on now because it seems like you know with the IPCC you have again these uh, scientists that are on board that are you know doing good research and then their research then gets passed along to a politician or someone uh, else in the chain and then that politician basically is going to take that science and push it to whatever outcome they're trying to get or whatever is favorable for them. So it seems to be, you know, very, very unethical 
you know, it doesn't seem to be like we're getting the best information possible. It seems to me like we're getting the information that the people from or our select few individuals from the IPCC want us to get. You know, it's not like we're really getting the raw data here. And it seems like that's what you're most concerned about. Is that is that pretty accurate? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. And I think one to add to that just a bit, I'm also concerned that the the earth science community is not speaking out more. And mm -hmm. I can see that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, they're catastrophizing it a little, but the ends justify the means, because if this really is a crisis, it's okay if we play a little fast and loose with the data, because, you know, we really need to change these people's policies, because what if this is all correct? And I would argue that scientific integrity is more important than that, because mm -hmm. climate change is a problem. We're going to face another problem at some point. And if if we're okay with our institutions playing and playing data because they think that the ends justify the means, then what happens is the public loses trust in science and scientists. And then the next problem that we face becomes that much harder to deal with because we're that much more distrustful of each other in the science. And, yeah. and so I wish that I heard more from the earth science community because a lot of times in the back channels, people are like, they shouldn't be saying that stuff. You know, we shouldn't be talking about hurricanes getting stronger because we don't see any evidence of that in the last few decades. We shouldn't be talking about this or that, but I'm not going to stick my neck out because ultimately this is just going to bring more funding in and people are going to care more. So it's okay that the, you know, that we're playing a little loose with the data. Yeah. Instilling fear in others is not a good thing. Uh, and like you said earlier, you know, when you are in a fearful state or when you're in fight or flight, you don't make good decisions, you know, and, and we know that, and we know that there's even science behind that, you know, because, uh, once you're in this kind of fight or flight state, your amygdala is just firing like crazy. And then your prefrontal cortex, which is you know, your smart brain, which does your, all of your executive function and that kind of thing, it's not able to function properly when you're in this fight or flight mode. So, you know, you're right. You literally can't think straight when you are in a fight or flight mode. And unfortunately, you know, this message that we're, you know, giving to young people today and, and to older people as well, you know, is probably inducing that sort of fight or flight response, which is definitely, you know, interfering with their overall critical thinking and their, you know, abilities to evaluate data, um, which is, you know, obviously very, very concerning. And then for sure, I, I, I agree with you and I can you know certainly relate in many ways to, you know, your, uh, your kind of frustrations with some of your colleagues not speaking out, um, you know, again, going back to COVID, you know, there have been a lot of physicians that have, you know, spoken out against COVID and we've seen, you know, uh, a lot of them being reprimanded or a lot of them have, um, you know, been ostracized by their, you know, uh, academic community. Some of them have had their, you know, I know Peter McCullough's uh, Wikipedia has just been changed, you know, considerably mm -hmm. to kind of like make them out to look like a quack. And so, you know, there are repercussions in, you know, saying something against this. So, so I think that's a extremely important point point because you know there's probably lots of people that are listening to this and they're saying well you know 99 times out of 100 i hear that you know fossil fuels are are dangerous we need to get rid of them and that you know the the, the climate change that's coming is going to be horrific um and you know you want to be able to you know s step up and say like hey guys like this is not too accurate but unfortunately that may only be you know one out of a hundred scientists that are actually saying that from from uh from the brief conversation that we've had so far like it seems like a lot of you know um, a lot of scientists are not speaking out against it and it's unfortunate too because that's what's happened with with covid now i think that with covid there have been not so many but there does seem to be trickling just more and more and more uh physicians coming out and speaking out and also to the data that's coming out whether it's on vitamin d whether it's on obesity whether it's on you know, the vaccines, again, I'm not saying that the vaccines are useless by any means. I think that they can be an incredible tool for some people, but, you know, I certainly don't believe in, in the mandates um, and, uh, and what we've done with, you know, mandating boosters and things to university students who have like, you know, if you're between 20 and 29, your, your rate of death, your, your infection fatality rate from COVID is 0.002%, right? So it's so low. It's, it seems like we're, you know, obviously, 
have put in too much measure, too much caution for for such a a low fatality uh, disease. And then the same thing now seems to be happening with you know climate change. It's like it's not like you're saying like there's nothing happening. Like you know maybe there is some climate change going on, and I certainly will ask you about that. But at the same time, you know it's no need to be a complete alarmist and to you know change other people's behavior and physiology by inducing fear in them based upon things that are not fact you know if it was based upon fact it'd be different but it seems like this is not based upon fact and the only way that we can probably change people's opinions is by having you know conversations like this and hopefully you can inspire you know, some of your other colleagues too, to kind of step up and, and speak out in the future. And I hope that they do. Yeah, I agree. I, ironically, I think that a lot of times putting folks into these states has the exact opposite effect that you intended to. Um, I see young folks, they don't think about being good stewards of the planet because the planet's going to be gone in eight or 12 years. So why would I be taking care of the planet and thinking about resources and things like that? I, you know, it's, it's all going to be a uh, gone in, in some, some, amount, some amount of time. So it has the exact opposite effect of trying to make people become better stewards of the planet if that's the intent of, of getting people freaked out about the climate. I think young people are having the exact opposite effect. And one question that I, I wanted to, to ask you about today was, uh, and I know this will you know take some time to answer, but it's, you know, how does the climate change? Because when you look back at history, and again, I'm not uh, an expert on this subject. But when you look back at history, obviously there's been some, you know, major climate changes before with like the ice age and this type of thing. And, um, you know, we didn't have, uh, or the causes that we're kind of citing now for climate change, uh, from my understanding, you know, didn't exist back then. There was, there was something else that was going on. You know, it wasn't, you know, this industrial complex that kind of, you know, messed everything up and, you know, overpopulation of people. So, you know, how much of climate change is just attributed to uh, the planet and how that evolves over time and how much is, is actually contributed to humans? Yeah, that's the trillion dollar question, right? I mean, that, that, that's exactly what we're asking and what we should be talking about. And, one thing that if you look at the IPCC's sixth report, they show that there's no natural forcing currently going on. And that would imply to folks that read that, that if we stopped anthropogenic forcing, meaning if we stopped emitting CO2 and greenhouse gases, that the climate would just be stable. And if we look at the geologic record, we see that the climate's never been stable. Hang on Long, just one second, though. So they're, yeah. they're, so they're basically attributing then 100% of the change to uh, what humans have done. That's right. And they actually even more, they attribute insane. 130% of heating from greenhouse gases, but then they attribute 30% cooling because of the pollution that we put up into the atmosphere. But 100% of the warming is essentially from anthropogenic forcing. And there is no natural forcing occurring, which to me would imply that if I looked into the geologic record, I should see a stable climate before humans were around and emitting greenhouse gases. And we don't see that at all. In fact, we see dramatic shifts in climate in the vast majority of the Phanerozoic. So that's what I like to talk about. So the Phanerozoic is the last 550 million years. And this is the time of what we call visible life. So Phanero means visible, Zoic means life. So this is the time when life on the planet evolved hard parts where we had you know, claws and teeth and bones, because those are much easier to fossilize. And we can actually see those in the geologic record, as opposed to things that are soft bodied organisms like jellyfish or something, for example, those are very difficult to fossilize. And if you look at the Phanerozoic, this time of life explosions on, on, on the planet, the vast majority, something like 80 something percent was significantly warmer than it is today on the order of five, eight degrees Celsius. The sea are on the order of something like 100 meters higher. And so to think that because we evolved cities in the last few thousand years and we built some cities along coasts, that all of a sudden now Mother Nature will stop changing the climate so that we're not inconvenienced is to me remarkably, you know, naive. The planet doesn't care that we're all here and that we built some cities along the coasts. 
the, the natural changes in the climate are going to continue to happen. Humans are going to influence the environment for sure. But to think that we're going to sell people that the climate scientists, the, the thousands of the most renowned climate scientists that work for the IPCC suggest that if there was no anthropogenic forcing that the climate would be stable is absurd. The climate will never be stable, whether we're here or not. It wasn't stable before we got here. It won't be stable long after we're gone. That's why when we, when we teach this course at the University of Alabama, we call our introduction to earth science course is an intro to a dynamic planet. And the definition of dynamic is always changing, right? And so th this is a beautiful system. It's the reason that life uh, is allowed to exist on the planet is because of all this change. All this change helps to open up certain environmental niches. It drives natural selection. This is the reason that complex life exists on the planet. To think that now we're going to stop the climate from changing is absurd. Yeah, that's, well, a couple really important points I think you made there, but the most important one that, that I heard anyway is that, so there's been other periods when obviously there's been you know significantly less people on the planet, you know, basically no industrial complex. And we've had five to eight degree uh, temperatures higher than they are now. And we've had sea levels 100 meters higher than we are right now. For the vast majority of the last 550 million years. For the vast majority. Okay. Yep. So, so I mean, one interesting point is where we find most of our coal deposits so something that you'll hear a lot of times is the climate's going to really affect how we can grow crops and plants and yields, and you're going to see all this massive uh, extinction events and things. When we look at in the geologic record, one interesting thing is where we find coal, so Alabama has a lot of coal deposits, where we find these coal deposits, the time period of the rock formations is what we call the Carboniferous. It's a time period that existed on the order of about 400 million years ago. We call it the Carboniferous is because there was so much plant matter on the surface of the, of the earth that, that we made all these coal deposits. And coal is essentially just a bunch of plants that have been compressed down and solidified into this you know, sedimentary rock that you can burn in a furnace and produce energy. And there's so much of that. So that's a time period where plants were the most successful on the planet. The average atmospheric CO2 concentration at that time was 1,600 ppm. That's four times what we see today. And that was the time period where plants were the most successful ever in history of, of our planet. So the claim that you know, our CO2 is changing into things that we've never seen or that the CO2 levels are becoming um, you know, so high that the planet won't be able to handle it just isn't supported by the geologic record because these events have happened many times. There was no runaway greenhouse effect. There was no major die off when the CO2 was four times higher. In fact, the plants loved it. It's, it's what they use for their respiration, right? So if there was more CO2, they can build more leaves, they can grow faster. And so it, you know, this whole claim that CO2 is some crazy pollutant just doesn't seem to be supported in the geologic record. So say then if all of a sudden tomorrow, uh, you know, our CO2 was four times um, what it is today, just say, you know, hypothetically that happened, what would you expect to happen? Like, would that have any devastating consequences on the planet? So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that rate of change is important. So doing this in a day may have some pretty detrimental effects, but stretching that out over some amount of time doesn't seem that the earth really, you know, the, the plants and the animals on the earth at that time did fine. Yeah. You know, they did great. And so it just doesn't seem to, now the rate of change is important though. So, so let's not, okay. I don't want to neglect that. You know, how fast these things change is important, but we know that the, the geologic history is kind of is sto stochastic where we have these crazy events that happen a meteorite comes and whacks into the planet or a super volcano goes off and yeah there's effects there's environmental effects sometimes we lose some 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 of the life on the planet um even times there's sometimes mass extinctions with a meteorite impact for example but when when we don't have those catastrophic events that are kind of these singular points where things change very rapidly the planet seems to do fine at very high levels of co2 
with no major detrimental effects that we can see in the fossil record. And and what are they saying uh, at the IPCC regarding CO2? Is their goal to just constantly lower CO2 emissions? And how do they have any rationale for wanting to lower the CO2 emissions if you know, in fact, uh, all the plants and animals were, you know, flourishing when it was four times higher. Like, what is their exact rationale for lowering CO2? Yeah, so the cl major claims from the IPCC are a fewfold. One is that we're going to see increasing sea level rise. Um, but, you know, as I said before, before humans were on the planet, the sea levels were never stable. You know, I don't think we should expect them to be stable because we built some cities near the coasts. Obviously, that's going to be a challenge. We're going to have to adapt to that. We're going to have to figure out what to do. Um, so they claim that that's going to increase the rate of sea level change. They talk about an increase in extreme weather events and the uh, effect that that will have on populations. They talk about mass migrations from places that get too hot. But, you know, the, the IPCC reports have been saying that since the 90s. And, you know, they, they, they keep telling us that this stuff was right around the corner. Now they claim it's actually happening. But if you just go and look at the data, so if you go to, for example, the, the United Nations has an Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, the UNDRR. And this is a, a started in 1998, and this is a, 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 an office that essentially tries to gather information from all of the natural disasters that occurred on the planet, and then they divvy them up into things like geophysical and meteorological and hydrological and climatological disasters. And they report this stuff every year. And so they started in 98, and if you look at their data, I like to look at it from 2000 to now because you know it takes a little bit of time to get these things off the ground and get them staffed and stuff like that. <laughs> you can see that there's actually been a reduction. It's very slight, but definitely no increase. There's almost no trend, but if you have to assign a trend to it, there's been actually a slight decrease in these events from 2000 to 2022. Okay. So there's actually been a decrease. Now that means that more people even though there's been a slight decrease in the events, more people are affected because in 2000, the population of the planet was 6 billion and today it's 8 billion. So even though we have maybe a few less events or about the same number of events, more people are being affected because there's just more people on the planet. And we tend to develop in these zones that tend to be prone to natural disasters. For example, more people building in Florida and things like that, where you, where you have the, uh, a chance of being hit by a hurricane. And so if you just if you go in and look into the data, you don't see increases in these. So even though they claim the IPCC continues to claim that these things are going to happen and they've been claiming that they're going to happen, the data just doesn't support it happening yet. And to steel man their argument, they're going to say, well, if you go back to these, look at what the UN uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Office talks about since the 60s. And so you, if you look at from the 60s, you do see a rapid increase in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and then it plateaus in the 2000s and the aughts. And the argument is, see, that's climate change. But if you actually go into the details of these offices, they're very open about the fact that before they were established in 1998, the reporting is really spotty. There's probably a ton of underreporting going on because there were no centralized offices to collect this data. And if something was happening in you know, the Republic of Congo, it probably wasn't getting to the offices in Brussels where they were starting to keep track of this stuff. So that older data is really highly underreported. So it's not very reliable. So I focus on these last two decades. And even if I even if I accept their argument and I'll steel man their argument that, okay, that is the effect of climate change. In 2000 and 2010, we saw the fastest increase in carbon dioxide and the fastest changes in temperature. So if that is exactly what is driving the extreme weather events, then in 2000 and 2010, if the theory is correct, we should have seen the most rapid increase in these events if that's, if that uh, uh, theory holds. And I, I pretty much accept now that we're so interconnected that you can't really have a natural disaster in some even developing country that's not reported. We pretty much, we know about everything now that's happening. We're so interconnected. And it's okay. clear that this, there has been no increase. In fact, you know, it's, it, it, 
putting a trend like this is a little fuzzy because it's almost perfectly flat. But if you really had to assign anything to it, it's decreasing slightly. But that doesn't stop the UN Secretary General tweeting today that they need you know, huge investment and a huge change in, in, in the way that we approach how we're, we're, we're approaching our energy policy because extreme weather events are rapidly increasing and they're affecting these you know, uh, un, minority populations more than anybody else. And this is a catastrophe, even though his own office, part of the UN clearly shows that that has not been the case in the last 22 years. Okay, so what I can gather from that then, Matt, is that from the 60s to the 80s, there was an increase in CO2 that did seem to, you know, corroborate with increased, um, you know, catastrophic weather events. And, but again, this was sort of, you know, old data that that people are, are looking at and sort of unreliable data, but that was the hypothesis based upon on that. And then we, you know, fast forward to, you know, 2000 to 2010, which um, my understanding was the period with the highest increase in, in CO2. And yet during that time, we didn't have an increase in catastrophic events, or like you said, if you had to look at, you know, one way or the other, there was actually potentially even uh, a slight decrease. It sounds like a maybe, you know, we say clinically insignificant decrease in medicine a lot. So probably something, you know, to that effect in the, in the climate change. So that should, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, completely, you know, nullify the hypothesis based upon the sixties to the eighties that increases in CO2 lead to increased catastrophic events. And then the other point um, I, that I want to make too, is that, you know, you mentioned uh, at some point that, you know, the population changes from, you know, obviously has changed from 2000 to 2023, you know, we're at 6 billion in, in 2000, we're at around 8 billion now. So I could easily just see like, you know, headlines kind of saying like, you know, it's affecting, you know, 25%, you know, more people, but it's like, yes, it's not because anything different has changed the climate. It's just that we have more people. So more people are going to be affected overall. That's exactly right. And another way they do this is they use cost. So one way is to do how many people are being affected. And of course, you know, you have to normalize this because it's growing. The other way they do it is they say, so this is Roger Pilkey Jr. has a great article just came out today or yesterday about how NOAA uses these billion dollar weather uh, events or weather disasters as this clear evidence that climate change is affecting the extreme weather events and that is costing us money. And the way that they do this is they compare a, you know, a, a hurricane that came in the 80s to something like Ian. And they say, look, Ian cost $170 billion or something like that. And, and, and that's clear a sign that this is an increase in a more severe storm. But that's not true at all. The reason that the, the, the Ian costs more than a very similar storm that hit Fort Myers in, I think, 83, was because there was something like a 700% increase in the population in Fort Myers area and something like a five-time increase in real estate infrastructure prices. And so the same storm that comes through and it does, it, you know, has the exact same intensity, the exact same size, everything now costs a billion dollars when a couple of decades ago, it was a hundred million dollar storm. And so Noah says, well, this is clear evidence that climate, war the warming of the planet driven by anthropogenic emissions of CO2 is driving these extreme weather events. And we need a ton of money because it's costing us money without ever actually going into the nuance of thinking about, well, okay, there is a lot more infrastructure. There is a lot more real estate cost now compared to what it was. We have to take all that into account. And they refuse to do that because when they do that, it looks like essentially a flat line. And then that nullifies the argument that this is all getting worse. And if things aren't getting worse, if we're not in a catastrophe or in a crisis or emergency, is there really a need for the international government panel or intergovernmental panel on climate change? Is there really a need for the UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction? Right? If these things aren't increased, how are they going to get more funding? So they have a, a, a huge incentive to make it appear as though these things are increasing, even though the data that they present themselves doesn't show these things increasing. 
Yeah, that seems to be, you know, quite unethical. And it also seems to, again, be, you know, something that people are, you know, uh, using to, you know, control people or control population. And, you know, whenever you say something like that, you know, obviously you're going to get labeled as someone with a tinfoil hat, who's a conspiracy theorist, but, you know, it does seem to be something that's incredibly effective anyway. I mean, lots of people online now, uh, you know, are talking about climate change, they're, you know, virtue signaling, they're, uh, you know, their 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 climate change practices and, th and this kind of thing. And, you know, I, I don't really, you know, see that changing too much unless, you know, we have more conversations like this. Um, but, you know, another question that, that I have for you today, Matt, is that, is it possible or do any group of scientists like yourself believe that, perhaps we're not doing anything at all to the climate? Like, is it possible that this is just 100% related to natural earth events and that humans in fact are doing nothing at all? Or is, or is it that, you know, we're probably doing something, but most of it is probably still related to just natural, natural earth events? Yeah, that's, um, I, I would say that the, the community that thinks that humans aren't having an influence on the environment at all in the scientific community is very small, if not nil. Okay. Um, and that's usually when you hear the consensus arguments, you'll see these papers that say, you know, 97% of scientists agree that climate yeah, change. Yeah. And so what they, the way they ask the question is, do you think humans influence the environment and, and climate change? Pretty much everybody says yes. But the debate lies between are we on the order of, you know, a few percent to maybe 10 percent influencing the, the, the warming? So we'd be responsible for maybe about a tenth of a degree of the one degree that we see. Or are we responsible for 0.98 or 0.99 of that degree? Right. That's pretty much where the, the science lies. And I think that there is a real even distribution across the board. Um, in the earth science community, even though it's the folks that are on one end, usually the 90% the and above end, that tend to get the most media attention, there's very few people on the zero end. I think there's very few people on the 100% end, even though if you look at the IPCC report, it really implies that there's no forcing at all. Anthro you know, uh, it's all anthropogenic. I think if you, when I talk to scientists at conferences and things, we're pretty much all somewhere in the middle. Um, I tend to probably be on the little bit lower side. Um, and it's difficult. Another thing is that, you know, we've, we've distilled a, a system that is a coupled nonlinear chaotic system to a single number, this global average temperature. It, this number is really meaningless. You know, it's like saying the average batting average of all baseball players in the in the major leagues. That doesn't really tell you anything about the specific batting average of individual peoples. The variability in the weather on the planet is huge. Every single day on the planet, there's places setting extremes in heat and there's places setting extremes in cold. And to talk about this as some average number of global temperature to me is just really distills a very complex system down and it's actually reductionist it's 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 a way to simplify it so you can talk to the public about it but it does a lot of injustice to the science because it makes it sound so simplistic you know so one problem is trying to assign these things these numbers to this you know so the fact that this is a a, a coupled nonlinear chaotic system so let's just go through that so coupled meaning that there's multiple equations that will define the system. So there's multiple independent variables and multiple, de multiple dependent variables, and they each have different effects on each other. And so you have all these complex equations that affect each other when you're trying to explain this thing, right? In science, we'd love to explain a phenomenon with a nice single clean equation, E equals MC squared. We can't do that with, with climate. So there's a lot of these different equations. It's nonlinear, meaning that if you do a small ch a purport a, ch a change in x, you don't get the same proportional change in y, and it's chaotic, meaning that it doesn't really have any sort of um, any sort of pattern. There's no there's no sort of um, um, uh, patterns and reproducibility that we see. So one thing that I think gets lost in the climate debate is a lot of the climate discussion tends to focus on models and future predictions. The IPCC freely admits, and the UN freely publishes this data that shows that these things aren't increasing yet, 
but then they go into this modeling, right? And so that's kind of what separates, I think, climate from a lot of other sciences is climate's really trying to predict the future. This orb, you know, it's like this oracle. We're trying to make these huge predictions in the future that are affect and, and really drive our policy decisions today. And to try to do that in a coupled nonlinear chaotic system is really almost impossible. These things are essentially undeterministic. And the IPCC admits that. They say that the models can never actually predict the exact state of a future climate system. So what they do is they do ensembles of models, and then that can give them a better, uh, a better uh, idea of, where, of what the future will look like. But if there is no pattern in the data before, it makes predicting the future very difficult because the way these models work is they usually look for patterns in the data and that lets you narrow the parameter space of future possibilities down. And then you have a better chance of predicting what the future would look like. But this and, system is so complex that we just can't do that. Yeah, and, and it sounds like you know that's what they try to do uh, in the 60s and 80s is they had you know, this correlation again between, you know, CO2 and catastrophic weather events. And then, you know, based on that, they likely did some modeling or made some, you know, hypothesis about, you know, this is what's going to happen in the future. And then, you know, even if they, now that they have the data from, you know, 2000 to 2010, they're still, you know, going with that data, which is, you know, to me, you know, silly, unscientific, and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not good for anyone. It's not good for the scientists. It's not good for people. So, you know, I think that absolutely need needs to change. Um, I know we only have about 10 minutes or so left and I have, a you know, one, uh, important question I think that I, I wanted to ask you was, you know, so what are we doing wrong? If anything with the climate, like what can, what positive things are humans doing that actually is making a difference for the climate and for our future? And, you know, what things um, are we doing wrong that is negatively affecting the future? So, yeah, I think that um, if you look at, for example, developing countries, now, the, you know, China and India are going to, we're going to kind of leave out of this talk right now because they're still kind of in the process. So they're making some of the mistakes we made a long time ago. But if you look at developing countries, um, you know, Western Europe, U.S., you can see a dramatic reduction in pollution. We're doing a really good job of cleaning up the air and cleaning up our environment. That's twofold. Partly that's because what we've done is we've outsourced all our manufacturing to places like China and India. So we don't have those polluting in industries anymore because we don't manufacture that stuff. But partly that's because we're doing a lot of mitigation at the source. It's a lot easier to control the pollution at the source, you know, put scrubbers in the smokestacks, for example, than trying to get it out once it's gotten into the environment. And so we've done really good. We've made huge strides in cleaning up our rivers, cleaning up our coastlines, um, protecting our species. I think habitat destruction is a much bigger problem than a couple degrees of warming. Personally, this is one of the reasons I would argue that solar and nuclear, I mean, solar and wind, although they're great for local applications and rural applications, they have a lot of great benefits in certain applications. They're never going to become the societal base load for our energy because the footprint they would require is huge. And we, you know, the habitat destruction is already becoming a big problem. The amount of habitat destruction we'd have if we switched our base energy load to wind and solar would be enormous. You know, a fox that's walking through somewhere in Wyoming, I don't think they, that fox really cares if it's a degree warmer or a degree cooler. Um, it, what it was, does care about is if its, if its habitat gets destroyed. And so, you know, I think we've made really good strides in a lot of places. Now we need, we've had this incredible focus now on CO2. And unfortunately, you know, humans only have a certain amount of time and a certain amount of resources to apply to something. And there's been so much that is being sucked up by this focus, the singular focus on greenhouse gases that we're neglecting a lot of other places like waste management. 90 or so percent of the plastics that get into the ocean come from a handful of rivers in a handful of countries. We could easily go and focus on those and go and clean those rivers up if we actually took the time and, 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 the, and put the resources into doing that. That would have a much bigger benefit than uh, for the environment, than you know, uh, stopping another coal power plant from being built. 
or something like that. So, you know, I, I think that we have done really great things, especially in the Western world in protecting the environment. We still have a lot to do because, you know, we consume a lot. Nothing is free. We, we can't live on the planet having an effect. We acquire raw materials, have a certain standard of living. You know, we want to mitigate those as much as possible. We seem to have been doing a really good job. You know, and now developing countries kind of have to get a pass because, you know, you as you grow, it's messy. Growing is messy and modernizing is messy. And so if you look at China and India, they're really what's driving now the growth in greenhouse gases. The Western Europe and the U.S., we've dropped 20, 30, 40 percent in some European countries. But if you look at the global number, the global number is going up and it's going up faster than it ever went up before. Right. Because we're not really stopping CO2 emissions. We're just moving those CO2 emissions from Western Europe and the US and kind of shifting them over to China and India because they're producing all of our things. But if we yeah. were serious about this, I think we could focus on things like nuclear energy. Um, it's remarkable to me that the same folks that are, are you know, uh, uh, at yelling at the top of their lungs that the planet is in a crisis and an emergency mode refuse to even consider the plentiful energy we could get from nuclear energy, which is carbon free. Yes, there are issues. We have to figure out how to deal with the waste. France does it great. They reprocess their fuel. It's 80% or so nuclear. Um, it's a carbon free, it's a small footprint. It doesn't take this huge solar farm to produce tons of power. You know, so we have solutions, but it seems as though the debate has already picked which solutions are the only ones that are available, you know, or, or, or are the correct ones. And then there's solutions that are somehow the incorrect ones. And we can't even offer solutions because, you know, of nuclear energy, because that's not the right solution. And so I really do think we're, we've done a really good job. I think we have a lot of room to grow. I think that focusing on things like waste management, sanitation, 2.1 billion people on the planet don't have access to clean drinking water at their premises. Those folks need water before they're gonna start really considering you know, what type of energy they're using and whether or not they're, what their carbon footprint is, right? Yeah, so 100%. You know, we, we need priorities. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you can't access you know, clean water, I imagine one of the last things on your mind is, you know, climate change. And if I'm using, you know, the, the appropriate energy for whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to do at that particular time. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left and this is completely uh, off topic, but it's just what you said at the beginning of the show, being that you're interested in the origins of, uh, of, of, of human species. Um, a lot of people uh, have been watching the uh, Netflix documentary that Graham Hancock did. Um, just wondering if you had a look at it and uh, what are your thoughts on it? If you, I'm not familiar with it. What is it? What's it okay. called? So basically, um, I, you know, I forget what it's, what it's actually called now, but you know, his whole thing is that uh, like things like um, the pyramids, for example, you know, he questions, you know, whether or not the Egyptians actually built the pyramids, like his kind of thing is like, you know, maybe what happened is that there was like a super civilization here, you know, oh, yes. that, was, that was kind of like way beyond us. They created this stuff. And then when there was an ice age or whatever happened, everything got left out. And then, you know, what's going to be left just some, you know, some stone or whatever is, is left around. Right. Um, so that's, you know, his thing is like, you know, that's why we can't explain Stonehenge. That's why we can't, ex or, you know, there, that's why, you know, he thinks that the pyramids were not built by the, the Egyptians. Um, so again, I know this is completely off topic and I don't want you to, uh, didn't want to want to put you on the spot too hard, but I was curious about, but your thoughts on that kind of particular theory. And, and I can certainly have you back on another time we can maybe get into some, you know, non-climate change uh, stuff a little bit more. There is some crazy theories that have to do with things like the Younger Dryas event and these past civilizations, um, these, these impact uh, hypothesis that there was these comet impacts and things. Um, I haven't really watched that one. Um, but one thing I can mention is that, you know, the, the pyramids, which are something like 5,000 on the order of 5,000 years old, they were built during a time period that we know as the Holocene uh, climate, ma climate maximum. Um, so this is right around 6,000 years ago. And this is a time period where the temperatures were about equal as they are today. 
And this is 6,000 years ago. The, the atmospheric CO2 level was something on the order of 270 ppm, so pre-industrial levels. But the temperatures were similar to today. In fact, the Sahara had lots of greenery growing in it. That's why they think one of the reasons that the Egyptian civilization was so successful was that the climate in the Sahara was so different. It was so much warmer there. It was much more optimal for that civilization than it is today. And we always kind of think of warming as being this this bad thing, this, this thing that's going to that's gonna really, you know, make life harder on us. And I think one thing that we neglect to think about is that there's a lot of benefits with a warming planet. There's obviously going to be places that are going to get warmer and, and that's going to be a problem. And that's, you know, it's never going to be a hundred percent one or the other, but I find it very interesting that, that the pyramids were built at a time period that appears to be very different than it is today um, in the Sahara, much warmer, much more humid, um, not the desert environment that we see today. Um, and I also wanted to, to touch on, um, oh, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, um, one thing. So because of that Holocene uh, optimum, so that this time period about 6,000 years ago, that was much warmer. I argue that because that occurred at, at, at pre-industrial uh, levels of CO2, we shouldn't really have an expectation of temperature changing dramatically if we lowered atmospheric CO2 back to pre-industrial levels, because just 6,000 years ago, we see that at those levels, the temperatures were about the same as they are today. And so if the effect that the IPCC wants is to reduce fossil fuel consumption, which lowers the atmospheric CO2 because that will lower temperature, I don't know if the geologic, the recent geologic record supports that that should be an expected response that we should see in the global temperature. Well, appreciate your, your thoughts on that a lot, Matt. And uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, but can you tell the audience where they can follow you on Twitter, where they can uh, follow any of your work online? Yeah, so uh, you can go to my website, MatthewWileke.com, or, or uh, I'm at, at Matthew Wileke on Twitter. So that's usually where I have discussions with people. And I appreciate people challenging me. I, I'm all for keeping this discussion open. You know, I, I try to avoid the ad hominem attacks, and I don't make it personal. I have kids. I want the planet to be as successful as possible in the future, right? I'm not Mr. Burns sitting back here like planning the end of, of civilization. And so I think we should have these open discussions. I think they're healthy and they can be, uh, we can agree to disagree and we can come to some conclusions and disagree on others. And it's, you know, it, it, I don't think it, we should personalize this. So I appreciate you having me on and, and keeping this stuff in an open debate. Well, thank you so much again for coming on. You know, I really do appreciate it. I think you shared a lot of really important knowledge today. And for everyone listening, I'll be back again with another episode next week. <laughs>